I think it's time for a project. And the project I've come up with is a little adapter for LED strings of lights because I've got various sets of these around the house and I've got a couple of 10 ohm resistors in series with USB connectors and I plug them into USB power banks and it runs them for a considerable length of time but it would run them for much longer if I was to use passive infrared detectors and a little interface that meant they were only lit when I was in the house. So, what I came up with was a little circuit board that you can plug a micro USB into it. My new favourite micro USB connector because it's dead easy to solder. And you can plug it into a power bank and then you can choose a passive infrared module. For instance, these little ones here. Make sure you get the polarity right. It plugs into this connector and then you can plug the string of LEDs into this connector and it will then power them, noting that this one has a built-in timer function so it will be a while before it sort of stabilises and then the lights will kick on. And the circuitry is, there they go, the circuitry is very simple. I didn't actually even draw a schematic for this, I just doodled. This is the first doodle I did, it was just a, a very rough sketch of what I wanted and then uh, on a post-it note and then I just went straight to the printed circuit board. But the idea is this. USB in, USB in, so we've got a 5 volt rail, 5 volts, and we've got a 0 volt rail, 0 volts. That goes to a connector at the other end for the passive infrared module, PIR module. And that has three pins typically. It's got the plus, it's got the minus, they have various names there. For instance, on this one, um, the plus is VCC and it's got ground and it's got out. So let's call that VCC and ground because uh, they just have random uh, names. But also the direction of the connectors between modules, different brands have the modules round the pin out, out different way. But they all seem to, well most of them seem to, check this before you plug one in. They all seem to, the ones I've come across so far, have the output in the middle. So what I came up with here was a pair of resistors, two times 10 ohm resistors, uh, just to spread the load more than anything else leading to the LEDs via a connector. So that's the string of parallel LEDs, or you could just use one high power LED if you wanted. And then that goes to a transistor. Now I decided to make it versatile. This one is using a 2N7000, 2N7000, which is a FET, but it could also use a BC547. And to reflect that on the print circuit board, I just named the pin that connects the negative as the emitter and also the um, source, which is the terminology for the different types of transistors. Let's show this one with a rough FET. That, that'll do. That's a very rough FET. And I just... Because I want to make it universal, I put a 1K resistor in series. The FET isn't going to be too bothered by that. So these are 10 ohms. Two 10 ohms in series gives the 20 ohms, which gives about 100 milliamps or so from a 5 volt supply. Uh, LEDs asunder. Um, and that was the original design. Laterally, I decided it might be an idea to make sure that I can cover for every possibility to actually allow the option to add a 1 meg ohm resistor as a pull down resistor to the input. So that means that when you unplug them, the L if, particularly if you're using a FET, which uh, is very, very sensitive. If I bridge this to the positive, you'll see the LEDs have lit, and then I bridge it to the negative, you'll see they go out. It's because it holds a charge. Um, it's very sensitive, and I'm not sure if all these modules do specifically pull solidly from the up to the plus rail and down to the negative rail. They probably have resistors as well. That's why I deliberately chose a fairly low value, the 1K resistor there which uh, allows for the fact there'll be resistors on the actual circuitry, potentially as well. But that uh, was the prototype. The circuit board I came up with looks like this. It's got the, this isn't going to make a lot of sense, it's got the 10 ohm resistors, the 1K, oh this is the second version, hold on, let me get the first version, that's, that's better. Here is the first version, which is very simple, two 10 ohm resistors, the 1K resistor, the position for the transistors, and the position for the connector, 
are the two connectors and the USB connector. And the circuit board, it's fine, that's what this one is. It's the This is the sort of prototype version. But afterwards I was thinking, when I drilled it, I had to drill one millimetre holes for these uh, connectors. And I thought that it, the pads, because they're very close together, it was just felt that wee bit small. So the second version, I increased the size of those pads. I made them elongated pads. And I also added that one mega ohm resistor. So I'm going to remake the circuit boards. And I thought, well, why not invite you guys along to watch that happening as well? So I've already made the transparency from the original artwork. And because when I'm making a batch of circuit boards, I'll tend to cascade several onto the one circuit board. And I already have, as a residual from yesterday's experiments, making it in the first place, I've got a piece of the light-sensitive uh, coated circuit board material. This is using the dry transfer photosensitive film. And I have to say I've had mixed results recently with that. Uh, the first few times it seemed to work perfectly. I've now discovered that it was probably overconfidence that was causing problems because... With this film, it's quite, I find the best way to put it on is to float it on in water. And once you've done that, uh, you then have to squeegee the residual water underneath out. And then you have to heat it because it's the heat makes it a bond onto the copper. And if you overheat it, it can evaporate the residual moisture that's in the gel and it can cause it to steam up and create little pockets of steam underneath. Oh, I should mention, you may notice this finger is brown. It's, it's not stink finger or anything like that. The finger is brown because I had an instant with the ferric chloride while I was etching. I had a rubber glove on and uh, the I didn't realise that I would punctured the glove and the, some of the ferric chloride got in. And yesterday this finger was just brown from the knuckle down. It was just solid brown. So I'd just like to point out that is what that is. It's nothing insidious or weird. It is just ferric chloride, which stains everything. So I've been going about with a brown finger, which is just, just delightful. It doesn't wash off. It will just wear out. Um, the... Yes, transferring this film on, I found that uh, it's a very critical thing. If you don't heat it evenly enough over the whole surface, it won't stick as well as it should. And likewise, if you overheat it, it does do that thing that not only the risk of steam, but also the plastic film on top can actually start shrinking with the heat and it shrivels up and causes all sorts of patterns over it. So um, it's a bit unpredictable. But... What I'm going to do now, I'm going to expose this with ultraviolet light and this transparency and then once I've done that, we'll develop it and then I'll etch it. So I'm going to do that right now. The circuit board has now been exposed and I've got the developer here. So it, things worthy of mention, uh, if it's if you're used to the traditional print, photosensitive circuit board material, it's the complete reverse with the transparency. It doesn't do that thing where where it's exposed, it actually weakens it. In the case of this stuff, where it's exposed to the ultraviolet, it actually cross bonds and links it, so it makes it stronger. So you use the inverted transparency. And this is also where I usually screw up really badly by forgetting to take the second layer of protective film off this. So let's see if I can... Loosen the protective layer of film and get it to come off. It is trying to come off. There it goes. There we are. Because uh, if you ever work with this stuff, there's a good chance at some point in time you're going to find, forget that that plastic film is on there. And when you do that, uh, no matter how long you expose it for, it just won't develop. The developer is based around standard sodium carbonate, is it? It is sodium carbonate. Let's get a glove on here. Hopefully not a leaky glove, because the next process will be the ferric chloride. And this is a very easy solution to make up. It's one gram of soda crystals, sodium carbonate, per 50 milliliters of warm water. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to submerge the circuit board in that. And depending on the strength you make it, the speed is affected. The stronger it is, the faster it works, but you don't want to do it too quickly because it leaves you plenty of working time if you make a fairly weak solution. And this is where it's really helpful to sponge off because, again, another difference between this stuff and the traditional photosensitive board, light-sensitive material, 
is that this stuff does require some movement. You have to sponge the front of it. If you don't, the material will just tend to sit there and block any further access from the developing solution. So it helps to uh, just gently wipe away. And as you can see, it's, it's going to the copper now. It's getting rid of that layer. So you want some patience with this. You don't, it's a balance. You don't want to leave it too long, but you also, uh, with the developer solution, in case it weakens the stuff you want to keep, but you also don't want to uh, stop too soon because otherwise there's a risk that the, uh, you might not have got all the material off. And if you do that, then when you put it, although you can't see that those tiny, tiny traces of material, when you put it in the developer, the etchant, should I say, it will stop etching at those points. So it's worth uh, getting it all off and then giving it a moment un under the liquid just to, you know, just leave it a bit longer to expose and develop. But it's almost there. Just a few seconds more, I think. I say that, I always say a few seconds more and then go on longer. Uh, another thing that's useful is with this movement is it gets the material out from between the pads, the, the little holes that are pre-marked in the pads, because that's useful. It helps with the alignment of the drill. And that's me more or less ready, I think. So I'm going to rinse this now, and I'm going to expose it with the, well, develop it, should I say, I'm getting everything mixed up at the moment. I'm going to develop it, I'm going to etch it, that's the next thing, because that's now down to the copper. And the first thing I'm going to do now is wash this, though, to stop the process of the uh, developing so it doesn't eat any further. The circuit board has now been etched. I used ferric chloride, hence the brown coloration of the hands before. And I'm using a technique that I've never actually really used before. Someone suggested I give it a go, and it works really well. I've always been cautious of applying too much pressure onto the photoresist when it's on the, well, the etch resist once it's on the circuit board when it's being exposed. But this technique, technique actually involves getting ferric chloride and a sponge pad and actually physically wiping the ferric chloride onto the uh, circuit board material, it results in an extremely fast etch. And as long as your material is properly attached, it won't knock tracks and pads off. I have had earlier experiences where it did when I wasn't getting good adhesion, but in this instance, it, it's been fine. But in the past, it was wiping, you know, a random pad would disappear, which wasn't so great. It's a very fast way to etch. So now that I've etched it, I'm going to leave this purple uh, or dark bluish purple coating on. I'm going to use my favourite mini craft drill, which came from RME Electrical, Radio Mechanical Electrical in Howard Street in Glasgow. I'm going to be using tungsten carbide bits. I won't torture you with uh, the continuous drilling noise. I'll drill it and then drill a couple of holes and then pause and then we can return once the rest has been drilled. But... Uh, Generally speaking, when I start drilling, I shall just do a test drill on areas out with the printed circuit board material, and then I'll start actually drilling the actual holes themselves. And I'm drilling everything at 0.8mm initially, and then once I've drilled everything with the 0.8, I shall uh, go over the larger holes that have to be 1mm, like the connector holes, with the larger drill bit. So I'm going to... Uh, Pause momentarily while I do this just to avoid the excess noise. The holes are drilled and now I'm using acetone to remove the resist. Using this paper plate as a handy surface, which is probably not that handy a surface. It's wicking the acetone away. This was probably a bad move. But nonetheless, I'm going to bludgeon on ahead anyway. The... Acetone is actually, it's one of the more, it's probably not safe for your fingers, though ladies use it on their hands all the time for nail varnish. But it's one of the more biologically or ecologically sound uh, solvents. It's actually something that is water miscible and it can also get digested by certain microbes in the water system. So it's not that bad as, as, as solvents go. It's certainly much better than the ones that uh, aren't, don't dissolve in water. They're heavier in the water. This is going to take a while. So um, I shall continue doing this and I'll be back in a moment. The resist is now off. So now it's time to chop the circuit boards. I want to mention that the older circuit boards with the uh, that you bought with the resist pre-applied 
you could just solder with that resist in place. It was quite handy. But this stuff, you have to remove it. It doesn't work that well. It's also gone a bit gooey. It's gone between, into the holes, but that's all right. It's when I poke the component leads in, though, that'll come out. So now I'm going to use a guillotine to cut the circuit board material. I've featured this before. It's a big industrial guillotine. I bought this some time ago. It is not for the faint-hearted cost-wise. It's quite an expensive tool. But when I was manufacturing circuit boards in bulk, it just made sense to have something that could cut circuit boards like this. <laughs> Chop. It's really super clean cut. Terrible at cutting the paper laminated board, but then again, don't use that. Fiberglass, perfectly fine. It does a great job, but it is an expensive tool because it is a factory grade component or factory grade tool. Like my ultraviolet exposure unit is also manufacturing grade. It's definitely in the category of factory equipment. And the etch tank that I used to use, which is the triple etch tank, which also had the developer section and the rinsing section, which was actually plumbed into the water and uh, water supply and plumbing. All very useful. So this uh, makes very short work of this. It's much better than trying to cut it with a Dremel or a hacksaw or anything like that. This just basically just chops. So this one came from Rapid Electronics, I think, but it seems possibly to originate from Mega Electronics because most of this printed circuit board equipment did come from Mega, which is a British manufacturer of stuff like that. See how fast that is. It's very useful. Now I'm going to go and get the components together and we shall build this, so I'll be back in a jiffy. Okay, that's me got the components, let's start building. I don't really need to refer to this, uh, I'll leave this here just in case you're, you end up building one of these because I'll probably put the circuit board design online so that you can download it if you wish and print off your own. So uh, what I've got here is the transistor position I've actually marked with ES at one side for emitter source, that goes to the negative rail, and uh, collector and drain at the other side, the middle pin of this, whatever transistor you use, it will be the gate or the base. Um, the connector for the pass infrared detector is marked plus at one side, minus at the other, and the middle pin is the control pin. Just double check. It just, it, it's a random direction, and maybe some, there's some pass infrareds that don't have that arrangement of plus at one side, one minus at the other, and the middle pin being that. Um, the little connector down here for the actual lights, I've marked plus and minus, but I've also, beside the connector, I've just put large pads for easy connection, just if you want to solder straight on. And that's more or less it. I don't need to add this one megaohm resistor, I don't think it's needed for any of these modules, but I, there's no harm in doing it, so I'll, I shall do it. And the little uh, USB connector is one that uh, it was recommended a while back as being one of the simpler ones to solder, I saw a product, it was a little power supply. What was it? It was a solar power supply, I'm not sure. But it had a very simple uh, USB connector on it, the little micro USB, which just had two pins. And I was trying to find them, and some of you guys suggested going on uh, Amazon, not Amazon, uh, AliExpress. And finding them there, and I did. So this is a one that's got really good anchoring pins for going through the circuit board. Plus it's got these two little tabs at the back. Instead of having the five terminals, it's just got two. So I'm going to start off with resistors. I'm going to start off with the 10 ohm resistors. I shall zoom down a little bit here, but not too much. And I could form them with my fancy tool for forming leads. I shall bring it in and show you it. But I don't recommend it because uh, it's kind of, unless you're in the scale of manufacturing, this is quite an expensive tool again. But you put the component into it, you pull the trigger, it crops the leads and it folds them. It's, uh, it saves a lot of time. It saves a lot of time, just makes things look neater and takes the stress off the component of the leads being bent. But just for uh, fairness, I shall just bend some like this anyway because this is how most people will be doing it, just like that. That provides a nice a finish, it makes it look smart. And when you're manufacturing, it does make sense to actually have circuit boards that don't look as though they were put together by hand. Get those leads out the way. 
Right, so I'm going to start off with the 10 ohm resistors. I've got two of them in series here to make up the 20 ohms and spread the load. I'm pushing them through the this the stuff, the gel that is used as the uh, photoresist. It's, uh, it kind of blocks the holes when you clean it off the acetone. Maybe in the future I'll use the uh, uh, soak it in uh, sodium hydroxide, which should uh, sort of basically just eat through it all completely. I've got the two 10 ohm resistors, that's brown, black, black, one zero and a zero multiplier. I've got a 1K resistor, which is brown, black, red, one zero and two zeros as a multiplier. And I've got... Oh, that is so annoying. That gel stuff has blocked those holes up quite dramatically. Not to worry. We'll see how it goes with the when I start soldiering. And we've got the one mega ohm, which is brown, black, green. One zero and five zeros. And to hold those components in while I solder them, I'm going to use a bit of sticky tape. I'm going to use insulation tape. Insulation machine. I'm going to just stick it like that. And bring in the solder, my favourite juicy lead-based solder. The uh, those uh, that material. I'm just going to try and uh, flick that away with a knife. I don't want it messing up the solder joints. It really has filled up those holes that didn't go down too well. That's annoying. As with all these circuit board materials, it takes a while to get used to them and their quirks. And each time you do it, you learn a wee bit more. That's the only way to get used to it, etching your own circuit boards, is just to start etching circuit boards. And the first few may work or they might not work. You have to get to know the timing of the materials. The modern ones are less critical than they used to be. And the developer that uh, sodium, what was it, sodium carbonate, is so much nicer than the sodium hydroxide version. Uh, there was also the water glass version. What's that? Uh, silicon... What is that? Water glass? I can never remember. Yeah, silicon hydroxide? Could be. Sodium silicate. That sounds about right. It, uh, it's quite an unusual material. It also makes a great developer for the original type of material, but for this, uh, the dry film photoresist, the best is the uh, sodium carbonate, which is also fairly mild. It's not necessarily hand safe, but it's much nicer than sodium hydroxide was. If you got that in your hands, it's burnt them a bit. And that's not good. So that's me always done with the resistors. This is a very simple circuit board to put together. There's so few components on it. The last component I'm going to put in is the transistor because it's a FET. And the 2N7000 FETs are very delicate. They're quite easy to damage. This also suggests that it might be a bad idea getting them off eBay. Because if you get them in the usual sort of imported style, they'll come in a plastic bag and that's not a good way to ship static sensitive components in little polythene bags. As so much of the stuff does come, it's quite disturbing how much comes pre-destroyed with static. Get those leads off and into the bin. Right, let's put in the USB connector. Had an instant recently, ordered some circuit boards. That will be featured soon. And uh, they take this little circuit, this little USB connector, and unfortunately, the factory that made them has resized one of the holes for some reason. Which is annoying. One of them fits perfectly and the other is a friction fit. So I'm just going to fold these leads over at the back. And I'm going to sort of the pins at the back of the connector. Maybe I'll leave them till last, actually. I'll sort of the side of the connector first. To give this extra support, because I'm a big fan of like loads of support for the micro USB connectors. I've got a pads at the side that I'm going to flow the solder onto the side of the connector. And that will give it super mega support. It will also make it red hot momentarily. I also want to make sure I don't flow too much on in case the solder goes into the connector. Leave it more. That's the bit that will go in. 
So that should give it tons of support. This is the only component that goes in the back. Because it is kind of a, a surface mount component, though not necessarily. I think there's enough room in these leads that you could make it a through hole component. The LED connector is going to be a 2-pin little Molex connector. It's pretty good. Like this. Again, I'm going to, now I've uh, poked that through, I'm going to wipe that uh, residue away from the photoresist. <laughs> You'll hear the chapping and buzzing in the background. That's the Chipo Chinese soldering station. Doing its thing, it, it, it stutters in and out with the heating element and the transformer just makes a sort of tapping noise and it does that. So now I've pre-soldered that connector, I'm going to carefully level it off. I'll push it against circuit board and reflowing the solder in that one pin. That looks good. Now I'm going to do the other pin. Like this. The solder's flowing onto the other pads at the side, it doesn't really matter. They were, they're just, I like to give options, so it's got the, oh, that, but not options. If I've just shorted that, no, I haven't. It's just a, a, the light shining off it. Options are good. For the connector for the pass and thread detector, I'm going to use the little three pin connector. It's a generic A. Very common on eBay. Uh, this one came from Bright Components, it's a UK seller. And uh, I got this a while ago. It's kind of based on the DuPont style connector that's very popular with Arduino stuff. It's quite a nice little connector. I'm going to solder the middle pin. And then I'm going to make sure it's standing square on the other side. Which it probably won't. It is. That's nice. That's good. If you solder just one pin first, you can then adjust it. Uh, on my other prototype there, I couldn't find these connectors. I knew I had them somewhere, but they were ended up in a component drawer amongst other stuff. I was looking the wrong place. Uh, I used a sort of three pin Molex, but just actually just crimped some short solid core wires in and then used it as a printed circuit board connector. Now for the transistor. I've got the transistor here. It's the I'm going to use the MOSFET, or the FET. Do they call it a MOSFET? It is a MOSFET. 2N7000. These ones came from Rapid Electronics in the UK. And they come in a anti-staticky type bag. Not the metalised one, but the one that's designed to create low risk of uh, actual static charge in the plastic. And the orientation of this one is, let's see, a... Uh, if you're in doubt about transistor pinout, just go and Google. Google the number of the transistor, do an image search and you'll find it. So this says, source is this one, which is going to the negative side, which is that side. And that's where this transistor goes in then. And I'll just sit it in, not, I'm going to sit it in not too far in, because that way the pins can dissipate some of the heat before it gets up to the transistor itself. Modern components tend to be fairly heat resistant though. I think the biggest factor of damaging these little MOSFETs is static though. They seem very sensitive to that. Some of the paranormal detector, ghost detector circuits use these MOSFETs basic with a floating input to detect a magnetic uh, electrostatic field and it's just kind of it's inviting electrostatic damage to those. I wonder how well they last. And that is it. Is it going to work? I'll tell you what, I could go and get another string of lights to test this. I've just popped the end off that passive infrared detector. The passive infrared detectors, you get a few different types. And they have, invariably have the little adjustment pots which are a bit hit and miss. And sometimes the labelling isn't correct. You get sensitivity and time. Uh, so it's worth experimenting with them, but it's also worth noting that the time has such a large range that at the very extreme end, it will maybe be 10 seconds, but it only takes a tiniest little bit of movement for it to be minutes. 
I like to sort of set it for, well, 10 or 20 seconds. That gives it time, if you're still moving the room, to detect the next movement. There is the other thing. They also sometimes have this little link that you can move from one position to the other. And the reason for that link is the re-trigger link. There are two modes these pass infrared detectors can operate in the, the BISS0001 chip here. Uh, the one mode is that it triggers and then it just it times for, say, 10 seconds, but it won't react to any input during that time. So after 10 seconds, it'll always go out and then you can re-trigger it again. But if you put it into the other, the link into the other position where it's re-triggerable, every time it detects movement, it will restart the 10 second delay, which means that the light will stay on continually as long as you're moving about in the room, which is the preferred approach. So let's plug the sensor in here, noting that this is negative and this is positive, so get it the right way around here. Plug that in there, plug the lights in, and plug the USB lead in, and there should be a small time delay. And then the light should light after that sort of circuit has stabilised. This uses a little 8-pin chip, it's quite unusual. It doesn't have any adjustable timing parameters, though. It just seems to be, and unless it's available on the... Uh, you can actually select it with the components on board. But it's one of those chips that has no information on it. Some of you have said the number may be underneath these chips, and you know, that makes sense, because given the pick-and-place machines, it's possible that modern pick-and-place machines, when they pick it up, and they hold it over the camera to actually check the orientation of the component, they could theoretically also check it as the correct component at the same time by character recognition. So there is a possibility that these uh, surface mount chips have the text printed underneath. One day I will actually lift one off and see what it says underneath. So this is now theoretically working. Uh, if I was to hold still for a reasonable length of time, it should theoretically cut off. I think it's about 10 seconds with that little module. But any slight disturbance in the vicinity, like me talking, may actually be creating enough visual disturbance to keep you triggering it. It's gone off. And then the slight bit of movement, and it triggers again. Excellent. So that's working. The other thing now is to crimp some other strings of light. So I'm just going to go and grab some. So I've got my lights and I've got my little two-pin little mini Molex style connector. Molex, amongst others, make these little connectors. They're tenth of an inch spacing, 2.54 millimeter. So I'm going to lop off this uh, set of lights from the battery pack that they came with. And I'm going to strip them with the wire stripper. Here we go. The pearl of these little strings of lights is the wire is very thin. Everything is cost optimized. So there's not much metal in them at all. Yeah, not having much luck there. There we go. I shall twist those wires a bit. Just to keep them together so they don't splay out when they're going into the crimp. And the crimping tool I'm going to be use, using came from Rapid Electronics. Uh, you can get tools like this on eBay quite easily now, but there's a huge range and they're not all compatible. This is the one I use, it's the little ratchet crimping one. And the first time I used it, uh, I didn't click with it terribly well because there's a certain technique to using it and the first few times you use it, it's quite hard to use. So I'm going to thread that wire in there into the little strain relief and crimp it. But once you've uh, done several hundred connectors, you'll be an expert. I've used this a lot. I used to make up wiring looms uh, with props so that the prop makers could just plug everything together when they were ready to actually build them into the prop, the control electronics. Now I've crimped them, I need to know which is positive and which is negative. I usually do that by getting a lithium battery, a little button cell, hook it up and the LEDs did not light, hook it up the other way, the LEDs did light. That means that's the positive. And since I've got my own little format here, I tend to put the positive into this pin of the connector. Ultimately, EBD will have their own preference. Uh, some of the connectors, actually, the larger ones, have a number on them. 
the number one to designate pin one. I usually use that as positive, which is kind of reverse of others might actually consider using uh, pin one routinely as a negative if they're particularly in the audio industry. So theoretically now, if I plug these lights on here, is my uh, is this USB power supply flat? I have a horrible feeling it is. Do I have another power supply that actually has power? Or have I miswired those lights? Have I got them connected around the wrong way? This uh, has a slight time delay before it powers up. Is it going to power up? Or is it going to make a mockery of me? Have I got these LEDs round the wrong way? There is a possibility I've done that, the connections. I'm just going to check with that string. Oh, I have a horrible feeling I have actually put that... No, there we go, there we go. Um, so, yeah, it's a nice little simple circuit board. It interfaces micro USB lead either from a plug-in power supply or a power bank to the LEDs and allows them to be triggered by movement. This isn't working quite as well as it should be, is it? There's something, there is something amiss here. What is it? Maybe if I push the plug in properly. I'll try those other lights because I get the feeling it might be an issue with the, yeah, I think it's an issue with this uh, string of LEDs. Right, let's uh, pat them out of the way. So the other sensors, just as I say, double check the pinout and also keep in mind that with these little modules, you can often have find an extra little pair of uh, pins that you can solder in a cadmium sulfide, the little um, light dependent resistor into, and that will make them turn on only at dusk. That's quite useful as well. But let's uh, try this one then. So this one is marked plus five at that side, which means, oh, that's going to be awkward. That's going to be, is it going to fit? It's kind of going to fit, but that's really going to fill that connector. That's annoying. Hmm. That's where it would be useful soldering the pads in the back. It's annoying that they haven't standardized in that. So, you know, you can get different detectors and they have different pinouts. Like this one uh, is plugs in this way around. Mm, annoying. But that's just how it is. So I'll provide links uh, down below in the description to these units. A, a generic eBay search link, which is fundamentally, it's PIR module. Uh, and they sell them for, for about 99 cents or 99 pence. Uh, including shipping, so they're, they're very cheap. And this is a very simple circuit board. You, I've got another video somewhere which just shows how you can use a resistor, a couple of resistors hardwired to a transistor to get the same effect. But it's nice that it's on the circuit board and it's got the little USB interface lead. And it means that, you know, for each charge of your USB power supply, the power bank, it should last for ages and it should uh, just provide ambient lighting in your house on demand whenever you're in the vicinity. So a nice little project, simple project, but a good result.